In this video, we will cover three topics. First, having seen that Aquinas considers that a demonstration qui of God's existence is possible, we will take a brief look at other ways of knowing God. Next, we will introduce Aquinas' five ways of proving that God is. And finally, as a prerequisite for understanding Aquinas' first proof, we will examine how Aquinas and Aristotle describe movement or change. In the previous video, we established that Aquinas believes that it is possible to demonstrate that God is. This demonstration would begin with beings that we immediately know, namely material beings. From these, insofar as they are effects of God, we should be able to reason to the existence of God as their cause. And we should, furthermore, be able to arrive at this with certainty. Before moving on to the specifics of this demonstration, we should note that Aquinas maintains that it is possible to have knowledge that is true, and sometimes even certain, outside of demonstration. Thus, although a demonstration quia can give us certain knowledge of God's existence, it is not the only way that we can know that he exists. Aquinas does not elaborate at length on this, but there are mentions of these other ways of knowing God throughout his works. As we saw earlier, one possible way of having knowledge of the truth is by faith. By faith in other people, I can have knowledge of truths that I myself have not directly seen or reasoned to. In the case of God's existence and of some of his attributes, it is possible that one can have knowledge of God through faith in others, even if this knowledge has not been arrived at by our own reasoning. Even more intriguing is something suggested by Aquinas in the Summa Theologica, Part 1, Question 2, Article 1. Here Aquinas speaks of a general and confused knowledge that God exists that is implanted in us by nature. His reasoning goes like this. All men desire, by nature, beatitude. Beatitude, or happiness, consists in the contemplation of God. And so, desire for beatitude is the desire to see God as he is face to face. Now, all desire implies some sort of knowledge of what is desired. So, insofar as we desire beatitude, and given that beatitude consists in contemplation of God, we all have by nature some sort of knowledge of God. Although Aquinas does not consider this a demonstrated knowledge of God, and although he calls it general and confused, it is nevertheless interesting to note that he accepts this sort of intuitive knowledge and desire for God. Having said this, we can now appreciate how Aquinas allows for other ways of knowing God outside of rational demonstration. These other ways do not, however, substitute knowledge of God that can be attained by demonstration. In the Summa Theologica, Part 1, Question 2, Article 3, Thomas Aquinas asks if God is. In this passage, he affirms quod deum esse quinque vis probare potest, that God is can be proved in five ways. In each of these five ways, Aquinas begins with something that is evident to us. And in each of these, he then proceeds to offer 
the outlines of a demonstration that concludes that God is. The first way that Aquinas presents is the one he considers to be the clearest of the five and is the one that is taken from movement or change, ex parte motus. Thus, to fully understand this way, we have to recall how Aquinas characterizes movement or change. One very important notion for understanding the demonstrations of the existence of God in Thomas Aquinas is the notion of movement or change. Motion, also called movement or change in Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, refers not only to a change of place, such as flying from Chicago to Boston, but to other types of change as well. For example, change of quality, such as a color and temperature, change of quantity, passing from not acting to acting, and so on. Both Aristotle and Aquinas analyze movement and change, and their descriptions of change make use of important metaphysical notions such as act and potency. To better understand Aristotle's and Thomas Aquinas' description of change, let us take the example of a dog. And let us say that we want to change the color of the dog from being non-blue to blue. Now the dog is going to become blue through change. In this example, as in any other type of change, there is a subject that remains the same through the change. In this example, the subject is the dog. In this change, the dog remains the same throughout the change. Although something about the dog does change, namely, it changes from being non-blue to being blue. In Aristotle's and Thomas Aquinas' vocabulary, we can say that the dog before the change is potentially blue. Potentially blue means that the dog is capable of being blue, although it is not yet actually blue. So, the dog before the change is potentially blue, and through change comes to be actually blue. Or, in other words, the dog is blue in potency before the change, and after the change is blue in act. So we can characterize this change in this example as the passage of the dog from being blue in potency to being blue in act. Let's take another example. This time, let's look at a painter. At first, the painter is not painting, but this painter can pass from not painting to painting, and the passage from not painting to painting is a change. In this example, like in other changes, there is a subject that remains the same through the change, and here the subject is the painter. Before the change, the painter is not painting. But through change, the painter will pass from not painting to painting. Again, using Aristotle's and Thomas Aquinas' terminology, we can say that before the change, the painter was potentially painting, and that the painter passes from potentially painting to actually painting through change. To use other terminology, we can say that before the change, the painter is painting in potency, and through change, passes to painting in act. So, in this example, we can characterize this change as the passage of the painter from painting in potency 
to painting in act. Both of these examples help us to arrive at a more generalized understanding of change or motion. In both examples, we have a subject that is capable of acquiring some kind of perfection or way of being. It acquires this way of being or perfection through some kind of change. In the case of the dog, the dog became blue. In the case of the painter, the painter began to paint. In both these cases, and in change in general, there is a subject that remains the same through the change. Before the change, the subject is said to be in potency with respect to some kind of perfection or way of being. So we can say that before the change, the subject is, in some way, in potency, and that after the change, it is, in some way, in act, and that the subject passes from being in some way in potency to being in some way in act through change. So we can arrive at a more general notion of change or movement as a passage of a subject from being in potency to being in act in some way. This understanding of change or motion, as we shall see, is important for understanding St. Thomas's demonstrations of the existence of God, which we will cover in a future lesson.